So, everybody's here for USN 101, right? This isn't uh, <laughs> some other class. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And uh, hopefully over the next hour, hour and a half, I'll uh, be able to give you a bit of the overview of history and some of the rationale for why we have designed the educational program here at USN in the way that we have. Um, so the goals of the presentation are to provide an overview of the USN educational model, its rationale and genesis in the, edu genesis in the educational literature as a framework for how the model is applied in the College of Pharmacy. Hopefully we'll give you a working knowledge of the USN model. And I'll present some statistics and results. One of the things I do have to thank you for is, uh, for those of you that responded to the survey, we had some really good response to that. Um, I asked some questions and I asked you to provide me with some questions. And we'll be going over the survey results throughout the presentation. And at the end, I've selected some of the more common questions to go over. And if we have time, we'll go over some of the other questions that came up as well. All right, so I'm actually going to start with one of the survey questions. So I think it was actually the first question on the survey asked which of the following could be used to describe the foundations of the USN educational philosophy. And the choices were the block system, mastery learning, active and collaborative learning, outcomes-based education, and student-centered learning. And these are the actual results that we got. So you can see that by far and away, the most common response that those of you that responded to the survey put down in terms of what describes the USN educational philosophy is a block system. And to a lesser degree, some of the other ones. So kind of keep this result in the back of your mind as we go through the presentation. And I'll come back and revisit it later, and we'll see whether or not any of your responses might have changed. OK. So. This next slide kind of provides you with what I feel are the four major elements that underpin USN educational philosophy. And that is mastery learning, those are mastery learning, outcomes-based education, active and collaborative learning, and what's called the learning paradigm. And as I go through the presentation today, I'm going to flesh out these with a lot more detail and provide you with some of the theory and background, both from the literature and um, some of the, the writings that have ensued from these uh, concepts over the years. And as I'm doing so, I'd like you to also kind of think about how is that actually applied then in the classroom? Okay. So um, these foundation el foundational elements even though I've sort of pictured them as these four separate columns, I really don't think of them as sort of individual discrete elements. They are very much tied together and support one another. And sometimes there's a lot of overlap even between some of those concepts. And I believe firmly that without any of those four elements, the overall educational philosophy and system doesn't actually work as well. So I think all four of those are necessary. All right, so let's start with the first one, mastery learning. Mastery learning was a concept that was actually developed by Benjamin Bloom. And any of you that have been in the educational field for a while have probably heard of Bloom's taxonomy um, for looking at levels at which we assess students. And uh, this is actually the same Bloom, Benjamin Bloom. So not only did he provide this taxonomic categorization of different skill levels, back in, I think it was like the 50s, but he also came up with this concept of mastery learning. Since he came up with the concept, other educators have codified it, taken it a little bit further, and have been, um, implemented it in educational institutions. One of the things we're going to touch on today is semantics and choice of words and why certain words are used and some, certain, some words are not. And I thought this was an appropriate time to talk about mastery versus mastery, because I think this is one of the words that kind of gets us hung up sometimes. I mean, obviously, when our students are in the classroom, we talk about mastery learning, but our students aren't masters, and we don't intend them to be masters at this point in their educational development. So when we talk about mastery, there are actually sort of two definitions that are pretty common. 
and they are slightly different. One definition of mastery connotes expert skill or knowledge. Another uh, way to define mastery is command or grasp of a subject. And I think you can kind of see the subtle differences between those two definitions. I would submit that really what we're looking for in mastery learning is the lower definition, command or grasp of the subject. And one way that I like to think about the differences between those two things is, you know, I've got an eight-year-old daughter, Laylee, I'm sure y'all have seen Laylee. Laylee um, has mastered at this point addition and subtraction, but she is not a master mathematician. So when we talk about mastery, we don't need to be hung up on the fact that we're creating masters. We really are not creating masters. We're trying to make sure that our students have command or grasp of the content that we're delivering in the classroom. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So, as I said, uh, once Bloom came up with this thought of mastery learning, this concept of mastery learning, other folks came along and codified it. And uh, two individuals that were part of that were Burns and Kojimoto. And what they did was they took a look at five elements within mastery learning. Those elements are philosophy, curriculum structure, instructional model, student assessment, and your teaching approach. And so the next couple of slides, what I'm going to do is go through each one of those individually and talk about them in a little bit more detail. So starting with philosophy. The philosophy of mastery learning is that all, stu all stu students can learn a set of reasonable outcomes with appropriate instruction and sufficient time to learn. Another component to this philosophy is that it promotes high expectations and aspirations for all students. And another component of this is that when students are given time and corrective instruction, they do learn. Okay, so with that as a background, let's go a step further and talk about how this philosophy of mastery learning applies to what we do here at USM. So the first part, all students can learn a set of reasonable outcomes with appropriate instruction and sufficient time to learn. So in our system, through the uh, system of assessment remediation, students are provided additional time to master content. So that's one way in which we put this philosophy into practice. And I'll borrow from our president, who likes to use this quite a bit. One of our philosophies is that learning is not a horse race, where everybody starts at the same time and is expected to cross the finish line at the same time. And I think if you really think about that from a a realistic perspective, but we shouldn't have those expectations that everybody starts at one point and ends at the same point at, at the same time with respect to learning. Next is uh, the curriculum structure. Well, first of all, we've got a six-hour day, 
that requires a variety of instructional methods that have to be used. In other words, in a six hour day, you can't lecture the students alone. It's virtually impossible to do that and do it well. And because there, there are a variety of instructional methods that are used, it, has a lot, it allows you to accommodate students with a lot of different types of learning styles. But the next bullet says. Also, because we have that time in the classroom, it provides us with the opportunities for uh, with opportunities for their students to ask questions and to get clarification and confirm that they've met the learning outcomes directly from the instructor. And also, and this is also a very important point. If you think about lecture in that format. Really what lecture is very good at is delivering content. It isn't very good at having students take concepts and apply them in various scenarios and in, in new situations. So the amount of time that we have in a six hour day allows us to provide these opportunities for students to really grasp and apply the concepts that we're um, trying to get across. And if you think about this, uh, the block system and taking one class at a time, I like to think of it as um, in contra contrasting that to a traditional semester or quarter system where a student may be taking three or four different classes at a time. When they're taking three or four different classes at a time and are distracted from, this other, from content by other content areas, really what happens is that students become a jack of all trades and master of none. So in order to master the ability to focus on one content area at a time really helps to provide that structure necessary for mastery learning to occur. I would also note that, because we're in this classroom, besides the curricular structure, the physical structure of the classroom also helps to promote the mastery learning. We have a classroom that's in the round where faculty can engage students on a very personal level. I'm never more than three or four rows away from a student in this classroom, along with the breakout rooms along the outside of the class where students faculty to interact with students when they're in their teens. So while we sometimes, I think, perhaps mislabel the USN philosophy as the block system, I would submit to you that the block system is merely a means to an end. The end is mastery learning. And the block system, somewhat like the classroom, is what provides the structure to allow the mastery learning to happen. Okay, with that as a cue, looking at this survey data again, would you change your answer in any way? Talking about the USN educational philosophy here. Does the block, is the block system a philosophy? No. The block system is a structure that permits mastery learning and as we'll see after the collaborative learning, outcome-based education and student center learning to occur. So we shouldn't call this a block system anymore. It's a USN system. All right. So let's uh, again go back to the survey. And I asked one open-ended question about what type, what components of the block system or, or what is it about the block system that can have ad, ad, advantages with respect to student learning. And these are some of the responses I got, some of the ones actually that I really liked a lot. Obviously, focused learning on one topic at a time. Again, think back to Jack of all trades, master of, uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. Here we're able to allow our students to master that content because they're focusing their learning on one topic at a time. Very common response to the survey was mastery of the topic, so I think we have a good foundation there. Opportunities for active learning and rapid instructor assessment and feedback. So those of you that responded to the survey before you can see in the presentation, you were doing, you are right on the right track. Better depth of learning. Um, this was a good one too, uh, sort of a logistical advantage. The students not hopping from class to class um, and the ability then to have those students sort of, you know, I think it's captive for a while in the classroom. And I think along with that, and this was, something that didn't come out of the survey results, but something that I added, is continuity. And again, I think you think back to how you were taught when you were taking three or four classes at a time. 
you know, you had classes maybe on Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 50 minutes at a time. So from the end of class on Monday, there was almost 48 hours that elapsed until you came back to class on Wednesday. And when you started class on Wednesday, you had to spend 10 minutes getting back to where you were Monday when you left. So this importance of continuity of learning is enhanced because we can do one class at a time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, continuously. So, back to the components of mastery learning, we've gone through philosophy, we've gone through curriculum structure. Let's now go to the instructional model. Um, a definition of an instructional model is a template that specifies how daily instructional sessions fit into the learning unit and are organized over time. In our case, we would call that the block plan. In our instructional model, we have a component that's devoted to instruction, then what I would call enrichment instruction, where we have the students get into their teams, do some active learning, apply concepts. We have formative assessment, feedback, and following that corrective instruction, followed by formative and summative assessment along with feedback. And at the very end of this whole process, Summative assessment. Now, um, one thing I'd like to point out here, because it, maybe this looks fairly prescriptive, the model doesn't talk about teaching style. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how just about any teaching style could fit into the blocks of the thing. We're not trying to dictate how what type of approaches should be used. You can use a lot of different types of approaches as long as the over or the sort of underpinning philosophy is. How do I get my students to really grasp these concepts? How do I communicate what they need to know? How do I get them to communicate back to me so that I can assess whether they know it or not? And then finally assess them in a summative manner. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about student assessment. A good strategy for student assessment is really critical to the successful implementation of mastery learning. And when I say assessment, I'm not just talking about a physical exam. I'm talking about a system to diagnose learning difficulties. I'm not talking about learning difficulties in the sort of cognitive psychological sense. I'm talking about problems and understanding the concepts we're trying to present. Mechanisms to diagnose learning difficulties and then to prescribe corrective actions. So to give students feedback when they don't understand and give them mechanisms to get them on track to really understanding those concepts. It also uh, supposes or presupposes that we, have, we must align the curriculum, the instruction that we give to that curriculum, and also the outcomes. And then your assessment hopefully then is also aligned to your outcomes as well. So, the last element within mastery learning that Burns and Kojimoto came up with was this idea of a teaching approach. And again, teaching approach does not mean teaching style. You have to be a particular type of teacher to function well within this mastery learning system of philosophy. Virtually any set of teaching practices can work in a mastery learning environment. The key is, to choose the activities, whatever activities are chosen in that six hour day as part of your responsibility as an instructor in the classroom, those activities are chosen not because they're good activities or because they keep the students busy, but they're chosen because they help the student achieve the desired outcomes. Provides a nice focus for you as an instructor in the classroom. You're constantly keeping those outcomes top of mind. And that's what you're focusing and directing your activities toward. All right. So, for those of you, and there were some questions about, they'd like to see some, in the survey, about individuals that want to see some of the background in the literature. So I've provided some synopsis of um, some of the literature regarding mastery learning in your handouts. I'm not going to go through these slides in the presentation. But for those of you who are interested, that information is there. And that's just a, a sampling of some of the literature that's out there. So we're going to be skipping ahead to 
to the next foundational element. We talked about mastery learning. The next um, element in that model was outcome-based education. And I pictured them this way very deliberately. I'm a very visual thinker, and I tend to think in pictures more than I think in words or auditory learning. And I really do think of mastery learning and outcome-based education as being intertwined very closely, almost two parts of the same whole. So um, before we get into too much on outcomes-based education, though, I would like to have a volunteer, if I could. We're going to have a little fun. All right, Janice. All right, so my expectation for you, learner, is to put that ball into the cup. I should say, cut the ball into the cup. You don't have to do anything about golf. <laughs> okay. Now, what happened when that when you cut it? Was it to the right, to the left? You didn't hit the hit the cup, obviously. Right. Skimmed it. Just to the right. So, what would you do next time if you wanted to get the ball in the hole or in the cup? Slide it up to the left a little. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, do it. Let's see. See if we get closer this time. No. Let's keep it right there. Oh, oh, much better. Okay, so that's, that's good. Thank you for helping. The point of that demonstration was really to illustrate how we learn. And really, how we learn in the classroom isn't that much different than how we learn a sport. You saw that she had an objective or an outcome. The outcome was to put the ball into the cup. She gave it a try. And she found out she was a little to the right. So the feedback, in, in this case, she got immediate, immediate visual feedback, was that she was to the right. So the corrective action was line it up a little bit more to the left and try it again. And she also brought into the concept of maybe I hit it a little too hard first time, so slow it down. So the point is that when we're talking about putting, or we're talking about learning in the classroom, this same iterative cycle is happening. So a student is given an outcome, they test whether or not they know that outcome, and you as an instructor see whether they've reached that target or not. If they haven't, you provide them with some corrective instruction, some feedback, and they try again. And eventually, they hit the target. Okay? So that process is exactly the same. And we'll kind of elaborate that on that a little bit more as we go through this component of outcome-based education. All right, everybody so far so good? All right. So um, when I think about outcome-based education, I really think of it in terms of what I call a Stephen Covey approach. For those of you who are not familiar with Stephen Covey, he wrote the pretty popular book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, back in 1990. And that book has seven different habits that will help you be a more effective individual. And I think we can take a couple of those concepts and apply them to what we do with respect to outcomes-based education. Um, and I, I kind of pulled this down to what I call the two habits of highly effective educators. The first one is, if you look at Covey's um, seven habits, is his habit number two. And that habit says, begin with the end in mind. His uh, habit number three was put things first. Put first things first. I'm going to again elaborate on these a little bit more as we come on, go along here. To that though, I've added my own. So it's the Covey habits, two habits of Covey plus one that I call the Kaufman habit number one. And that is to know and be able to explain why you're doing what you're doing as an instructor in the classroom. Okay, so let's go back to these. Begin with the end in mind. What do we mean here? As you're considering either an overall curriculum, an individual course or block within a curriculum, or what you're doing in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis, 
where you should start in that thinking process is what is most essential for our students to know, to be able to do, and be like in order to be successful once they've graduated. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, is produce successful graduates, correct? Successful professionals. So we should start from the perspective of what do we need to know? Okay? Once we have that in our minds, and hopefully there's consensus among the faculty within your program about this, then instructional content, time, and activities can focus on supporting students' achievement, achievement of those knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. In other words, what I'm saying is that, unfortunately, across the country, I think a lot of curricula have become bloated with things that are either outdated or unnecessary or not relevant to creating a competent professional. So we need to really think about that and consider it day, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're in the classroom to ensure that the activities and the outcomes that we want for our students match up and align with what we want to produce at the end. Okay, so the next cubby habit was to put first things first. And you can kind of see how this segues from the conversation we were just having. I guess it's already the dialogue I was just having. It wasn't going to a conversation, was it? Anyway, put first things first. Prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. We have a finite amount of time in our curriculum. I'm sure that there are some of us that if we had our, brother, our brothers and we wanted to put everything into the curriculum that we possibly wanted to, we could have a curriculum that was 10, 15 years long. That's just not practical. So we have a finite amount of time. We cannot teach them everything. It doesn't matter what discipline we're talking about, we absolutely cannot teach the students everything. Therefore, the curricular content and time must be justified on the basis of the ultimate desired outcome. And I would challenge you in your curriculum committees to put that to the test whenever somebody comes to you with a block plan. And they say, I want to talk about dog therapy. Is, does that need to be there? Think about it. All right. The next one was my habit. Know and be able to explain why you're doing in the classroom what you're doing in the classroom. And uh, another way that I like to think about this is a purpose-driven curriculum. And then I kind of, that wasn't my, my phrase, I borrowed that from uh, Rick Warren who wrote uh, Purpose Driven Life. But if you don't know why you're teaching what you're teaching, then con I would submit to you that content and coverage are dominating what you're doing in the classroom. And if you can't explain why you're teaching what you're teaching, in the context of what a competent pharmacist, nurse, biz business person, or orthodontist should be able to do or know, then maybe you should think about prioritizing other content, given that we do have a finite amount of time. Another corollary to this is if you can't explain why you're teaching what you're teaching, you can't explain it to your students or your colleagues to understand, expect them to understand either. So if I'm teaching in pharmaceutics about uh, how to, why it's important to understand the excipients in a tablet, I'd never be able to tell you, as my colleagues in the College of Pharmacy, why I think it's important, and I darn well better be sure able to tell the students that. There's no quicker way to lose credibility with students when they say to you, well, why are you telling me this? And you don't have an answer. So think about why you're teaching what you're teaching and be able to explain that in the context of what you want that ultimate graduate to look like and be able to do. All right, so with that, I asked a question in a survey that was fairly similar to this. The question was, uh, as an instructor, instructor using the US and educational philosophy, the highest teaching priority should be that content and coverage of material is all inclusive. As you can see, we got more falses than trues. What do you think? Did the survey come out the way it should? Is false right? Exactly. 
Content and coverage is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that what you're doing in the classroom, we can't teach it all, what you're doing in the classroom supports their ability to have those ultimate desired qualities, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors that a graduate needs to have to be successful. Okay. So, let's talk a little bit more about outcomes-based education and how to actually operationalize it and how it actually works. So there are a couple fundamental principles. One is that instruction is designed around clearly defined outcomes that you would expect all students to demonstrate. And think about that in the context of what we just said. If we decide what the, ultimate, the graduate ultimately has to be able to know, do, behave, what attitudes they should have, then we should design our instructional activities likewise. Um, and then all students must be provided with the opportunity to achieve those outcomes. Otherwise, the product that we're putting out is not what we're advertising that it should be. And to do that, they have to have sufficient time to achieve the outcomes, sufficient support to achieve the outcomes, and sufficient feedback through assessment to achieve the outcomes. And you see again here how closely that interpolates with the concepts that we talked about within mastery learning. And again, it's why I think of those two as really two arms of the same thing. So operationalizing is, of course, it starts out by having to use clearly defined outcomes for all students. You have to clearly communicate those out outcome expectations for all students. You have to organize and design instructional activities in order to help students achieve the desired outcomes. Once they achieve the outcomes, you should have a mechanism to formally acknowledge and document their achievement. And then you have to be able to and willing to modify your instruction based on documented student achievement results and data on instructional effectiveness. Okay, any questions so far? All right, so let's go back to our golf lesson. And if I could have a parent, thank you. No, do you hear? You got a for the golf tournament on, uh, on Monday. So, you go ahead and please put the ball into the cup. Okay, so the outcome is put the ball in the cup. cup. However you want it. <laughs> All right. You didn't pass. No, you didn't pass. No, um, you had to actually cut the ball from at least three feet away. Ah, I didn't tell you that, did I? So I did not define the outcome adequately for him to be able to achieve that outcome. So again, thinking back to this and thinking how students learn, and in addition to providing them with the activities that allow them to reach the outcomes, you really have to clearly communicate what your expectations are. Otherwise, you can't hope to have students achieve those outcomes. All right, so outcomes, USN speak, okay? Why do we use the word outcome and not objective? You see the word objective a lot in your educational history and, and, and even in today in educational systems everywhere. Why do we use the word outcome and not objective? Well, for one, outcome, if we use the word educational outcome, it really ties all of our activities very clearly and tightly to outcomes-based education. But secondly, if we look at the actual definition of those two words, outcome is a much stronger word than objective. You look in a dictionary under the word objective, what you find is something toward which effort is directed, a synonym being intention. And we all know what intentions do with roads and paving, don't we? They don't necessarily get us where they want us to go or where we want to go. Outcome, on the other hand, is something that follows as a result or consequence. So when we say we're communicating an outcome, our expectation is that everyone will achieve that outcome. We aren't just directing effort and hoping something happens. We are really providing 
the structure and the basis for that outcome to be achieved. Okay, so back to our survey, we had a question like that. True or false, education uses the words objective and outcome are interchangeable. I think this must have been seeping in through the collective uh, consciousness of faculty and staff because just about everybody got this one right. So it is not true that objective and outcome can be used interchangeably. Let's take a look at how well, one easy way to sort of differentiate in the educational environment an objective from an outcome. Here's an example of a content objective that you might see on a syllabus in a pharmacy school somewhere. Not here, but somewhere. To know the pharmacological agents used to treat diabetes. Okay? Now, if I were to take something very similar to that but turn it into an outcome, I would say, Following this instructional session, the learner will be able to select an appropriate oral hypoglycemic agent for a patient with renal disease. Okay? Now, what are the elements that make a good learning outcome statement? Well, a good learning outcome statement specifies who is to perform the action. So in our case, the learner, if you go back to the example that I just gave you, the learner or you could say the student is going to perform this action. What action should this learner take? Well, they will be able to select an appropriate oral hypoglycemic agent for a patient with renal disease, going back to my example. The result from the expected action is that they would actually, then when they're assessed, be able to select that appropriate oral hypoglycemic agent. And I think if you're looking at your outcome statements that you're providing in your daily classroom activities, they're a really good litmus test to use. The litmus test for a good learning outcome statement is, can the action taken by the performer be assessed? Okay? So, going back, well, I won't do that now. Um, going back to the objective, an example of objective, objective that I had on the previous slide, to be able to know Diabetes, agents used to treat diabetes or whatever it was. How do you assess no? I could go up and I could say, Manas, do you know those agents? And you'd say, yep, I know them. And I'd say, okay, well, I just assessed that he knows them. But what does that really mean? Does he really know or understand it? Whereas if I say, select an appropriate agent, oral hypoglycemic agent, for a patient that's, that has renal disease, I can see clearly how to assess that. I'm going to give them a scenario with a patient with renal disease and say they're a diabetic patient. Now you select the appropriate oral hypoglycemic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about verb choice. And hopefully I won't get too contradictory here because in one case I'm going to say verbs are important and the other one I'm going to say verbs are important. But anyway, in this context, the choice of a verb can be very important in clarifying expectations and assessments for students. When you choose a verb on your outcome statement, it should be chosen as an action verb that results in overt behavior that can be observed or measured. Some example of bad verbs in outcome statements would be know, become aware of, one of my favorite ones, appreciate. You see appreciate a lot, don't you? How would I assess appreciation? Do you appreciate uh, that an oral hypoglycemic agent can treat diabetes? Well, darn it, yes, I can appreciate that. Okay? But how does that get us to our goal? You know, it's not, a good, it's not a good verb. To learn. How do I assess that? Did you learn it? Yep, I learned it. To understand. Again, how do you assess understanding? Or, or to be familiar with? Well, again, being familiar with. I'm familiar with the fact that uh, the Earth goes around the sun. Can I calculate the orbit? I'm not so sure. Some examples of good verbs. Analyze. Compare. Uh, compare and contrast. Compute. There's a good one. Predict. And select. So those are really clear verbs. And it not only helps you to design your assessments, 
but even more importantly, it communicates something very vivid and accurate to the student. And a student needs to have a clear communication so they know how to meet your expectations. Okay, so this isn't on your slides, but I have a quick thing. This is something that I do in class a lot. It is a mechanism to generate student engagement in the learning process, hopefully. The way this works is I use a technique that's called think, pair, share. And so I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to think about an answer to that question on your own. Then I want you to share the answer with your neighbor, and then we'll ask one of you to report back. Okay? Julie's hiding already. <laughs> All right. So the question is, how would you change this learning objective into a learning outcome? So here's the objective. To know the three mechanisms by which metformin modulates blood glucose levels. So think about an answer to that question on your own. Once you have an answer, then share your answer with your neighbor. See if you guys agree. And then we'll see if somebody can report back on behalf of the class. I think since you brought out three different uh, compounds, uh, I would use the compare and contrast. Okay. So you, what would you say specifically? Uh, I would say compare and contrast the three mechanisms by which uh, metformin modulates uh, blood glucose levels. Okay, so compare and contrast the three mechanisms by which metformin modulates blood glucose levels. Would anyone make any changes to what Manas just said? Remember the three elements of a good learning outcome. But if we were putting together a good outcome statement, we would say at the end of this learning session, the student would be able to compare and contrast, identify. Carla, did you want to volunteer? No, no you're fine. <laughs> okay. I agree. You agree? <laughs> That's good. Or you might even want to say, here's the one that I came up with. At the conclusion of today's class, the student will be able to list three mechanisms by which metformin modulates blood glucose levels. Now, I'm not going to go into this at this point in time, but just some food for thought. If this were your learning outcome, where's my clicker? How would you construct an assessment item that would show that the student was able to do that outcome? So again, we don't have to go into that now, but think about how you would then pair your assessment item with the learning outcome. All right, so let's go on then and bring up another commonly used word at USN, USN speaking, that I think requires a little bit more elaboration. Why, do we, why are we so hung up on using the word assessment and rather than exam or test? Well, for one thing, it just sounds better with respect to the word outcomes, right? So if you think about assessment versus exam versus test, would you examine student achievement of outcomes? Would you test student achievement of outcomes? Or would you assess student achievement of outcomes? So I think in terms of that vernacular, probably assess kind of fits better with what we're doing with respect to outcomes. But also assessment is actually a bit broader term with respect to methods. If you look again in the dictionary at definitions of examination or test, you'll find that an examination or test is a series of questions designed to determine knowledge. 
Whereas the definition of assessment is not so specific as to how to determine knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. It opens you up to a lot more different avenues in terms of how to assess whether or not students have achieved those outcomes. Okay, so we've been through mastery learning, outcomes-based education. The third element of the USN philosophy is active and collaborative learning. And if we think about those types of teaching and learning, uh, active and collaborative learning, these are but a subset of the many potentially effective uh, instructional methods that you can use. But again, in order for uh, whatever method we're using, including collaborative and active learning, to be effective, it must support the educational outcome. So everything, again, ties back to what we talked about before. So active learning. What is active learning? Uh, active learning is providing educational experiences that allow students to engage in the learning process. There are several types of examples here. Case studies, role playing, debates, scaffolding, decision trees, flow charts, lots of different things that you can do. Actually, quick thinks is an example of active learning. Um, so these are activities in which students create, apply, assess, make recommendations on concepts presented. And notice the verbs that are used there. So for those of you that are a little more familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, look at those verbs. Those verbs are all higher order verbs, correct? So we can get to a lot of those higher order, order Bloom's taxonomy issues in our active and collaborative learning activities. Whereas with lecture, what are we doing? We are delivering content to students. And delivery of content isn't requiring them to assess, analyze, all these higher order stuff. So unless we move away from just lecture, how can we expect our students to develop those higher order critical thinking skills? One way that I like to frame active learning is don't ask them, meaning the students don't ask them when you, uh, don't tell them, sorry, I knew I was getting that wrong. Don't tell them when you can ask them, or don't tell them when you can show them or when they can show you. And again, if you think about that and how you would operationalize that, that gets us back to what we were talking about before. If I tell the students everything, then content is dominating what I'm doing in the classroom. Whereas if I let them tell me or let them show me, then they are actively engaged in the learning process. And I'm actually able then to assess whether or not, in a formative way, they're getting they're making progress toward achieving those outcomes. So don't ask, don't tell them when you can ask them, and don't tell them when they you can show them or that they, tell, they can show you. Okay, so that was kind of related to, again, one of our survey questions that we had. True or false, in the USN educational model, the instructor's main focus should be to present information to students. And again, the not predominant response there was false. What do you think? Is that the correct response? Yes. So we should not be um, focusing on presenting information to students. Okay. Collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is providing opportunities for students to learn from and teach each, others, each other. That's why we put our students in teams. And in the team setting, Students can learn from other students. And this can be really good because actually sometimes, and I found this to be the case as I've walked around in the teams as they're doing one of my activities, I found that actually sometimes the peer can explain to their fellow student the concept better than I could. Not that I said that it right or wrong, it's just for some reason that communication mechanism from student to student was better for the learner than it was for me to the student. That's okay. I don't care. I don't have to be the... Uh, the center of the instruction. My main, main goal is that the student get there. Another advantage to this is that when, when students are teaching other students, and I think you find this in spades as an instructor, but certainly hopefully our students take away some of this as well, is that you know that you know the material when you can teach it to somebody else. And so providing the students to have that opportunity within that team and 
environment of collaborative learning also supports their learning, and not only their learning, but also their confidence in how well they've achieved those outcomes. Also, uh, sort of outside of content or curricular knowledge base, being in teams helps students develop their socialization skills. And I think you can argue that in today's world, that socialization is very important. We can't be holders anymore in the information age. In the College of Pharmacy, our team members are assigned by the college. We try to structure them so they'll be as diverse as possible. And we try to construct activities so that team members must interact positively in order to achieve mutually positive outcomes. Now, I'll just a cautionary note here. I think you have to realize that regardless of what we may think we can expect, it really is incumbent upon the faculty member to ensure that that positive collaboration is happening. You need to be going around to those teams, checking on them, and making sure that they are focusing on and working together toward this outcome. So you can't just, I don't think it's wise to just leave the teams alone and say, go to it. You've got to provide some structure. All right, so again, uh, to take a look at the next few slides in the handout, those are, again, some evidence from the literature that shows how collaborative and cooperative learning uh, can be superior to just passive learning or learning by individualistically. Um, so again, I'm not going to go through that, but for those of you that like to see some of the literature, it's there for you. All right. Next thing is the last foundational element, which, it, which we call the learning paradigm. And this is taken from, um, I, I would say, probably one of the most seminal articles in education that has come around in a long time. The article was called From Teaching to Learning, A New Paradigm for Undergraduate Education by Barr and Tag. It was written in 1995, appeared in the uh, educational journal called Change. And since 1995, uh, it's, it's become one of those articles that people just say, oh, the Barr and Tag article, and everybody knows what you're talking about. So this is a very clear and definitive article that really, I think, produced a sea change in the way in which a lot of people look at what we're doing in higher education. And in this case, they, they focus on undergraduate education, but I really don't think that there's a distinct, distinction between that and professional or graduate education. What they do in this article, what Barnes had to do in this article, is compare and contrast with the more traditional instructional paradigm to a new learning paradigm. And I'm going to compare and contrast for you on the next couple of slides. In the instructional paradigm, the college's purpose is instruction or teaching. Whereas in the learning paradigm, the college's purpose is to produce learning. You see the change in focus there. With the instructional paradigm, the college aims to transfer knowledge from faculty to students by offering courses. In the learning paradigm, the college aims to create environments that effectively produce student learning. Again, the focus here is in the instructional paradigm, the product is actually somebody getting up and presenting information. In the learning paradigm, the focus or the outcome is what do students learn. In the instructional paradigm, learning is framed atomistically. Knowledge consists of matter dispensed or delivered by an instructor. In the learning paradigm, however, learning is framed holistically. Knowledge consists of frameworks or holes that are constructed by the learner. And if anybody wants to get into some really fascinating reading stuff that I really like to kind of delve into, there have been a, there's been a lot of uh, there have been a lot of publications looking at how people learn. And what's emerging as the most consistent theme with respect to how people learn today is it really has nothing to do with the input that's put into somebody's brain. How people learn is by constructing these frameworks within their own minds. Being able to relate something that is brought to them in terms of instruction, whether it's a lecture or an active learning format or whatever it is, being able to relate that to something else they had in their mind at one time. Creating these frameworks with it mentally is what produces the learning, not simply placing or plunking a concept down in someone's head. You plunk a concept in somebody's head and it's going to go away. 
The key to learning is creating those frameworks. In the instructional paradigm, the chief agent in the process is the instructor. And I don't know, for those of us that do have a bit of an ego, it may be a little blow to us that we are not the center of the world anymore. But in the learning paradigm, the chief agent is the instructor, or is a student, or the learner. So again, it really kind of twists conventional education on its head, reshifts the focus. But I think in reshifting the focus is really putting a different em emphasis on what that outcome should be. Is the outcome somebody standing in the classroom and, and providing information? Or is the outcome actually producing an, a graduate or somebody that leads your class who actually knows something? Okay, so I can't get away from the instructional paradigm and not talk about our culture a little bit, and that is the D word. Everybody knows what the D word is, right? What's the D word? Departments. I still try to I get a little shiver up my spine when somebody uses the D word, but uh, I, you're not going to probably eradicate the D word, but we'll try. Anyway, if you think about going back to this instructional paradigm, the old paradigm, when colleges atomistically organize courses in faculty and faculty de departments, and unfortunately these departments rarely communicate with one another. And an kind of interesting side note, I went on a accreditation site visit last week to another college of pharmacy where they had departments and my goodness you saw this just in spades where the two departments didn't just talk to one another they had no idea what the other departments were doing and unfortunately the structure that's been created in some of the more traditional um, colleges and universities has only facilitated that it hasn't facilitated the separation it hasn't brought back things together so these discipline associated academic departments are the structure by which the essential work of the college is accomplished, that is, offering courses. And I guess one of my favorite quotes, and this because it, it's just so true, uh, was from a professor, professor of English and former executive vice chancellor at UCLA. Departments have a life of their own. They are insular, defensive, self governing, and compelled to protect their interests because the faculty positions as well as the courses that justify funding those positions are located therein. So by eliminating the D word in departments, we avoid a lot of the uh, commensurate issues and problems that result from having a group of faculty not working toward a common interest within a college, but working rather toward their smaller interests within a department. Okay, so we've gone through sort of the essential elements. And as you put these elements together and have this work in your classroom, I think what you'll find are some corollary, what I call corollary and ancillary benefits to this foundation. And one of those things is, one of the benefits is increasing student motivation. And if you take a look at this book called Tools for Teaching by Barbara Bruce Davis, and for those of you who are teaching actively, I highly recommend this book to you. Um, you can find it on uh, um, oh shoot, what's that? Like Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com. Amazon it's very easily found. But it's a really good book uh, to give you some ideas of how to be effective in the classroom. There's a whole chapter on increasing student motivation. And what she says in that chapter in terms of increasing student motivation is that you should give frequent and early feedback. And as I go through these, think about how well these correlate to the US N system that we just talked about. Give frequent early feedback back. Help students find personal meaning and value in the material. Create an atmosphere that's open and positive. She talks about motivational strategies. Capitalize on students' existing needs. An active participants in learning. Students learn by doing, making, writing, designing, creating, and solving. Passivity dampens student motivation. And that goes back to what we said before. Don't tell students something when you can ask them. So other motivational strategies, uh, again, hold high but realistic expectations for students. Again, think about how that goes right back to what we talked about with the USN model. Tell students what they need to do to succeed. In other words, clearly communicate 
your outcome expectations to students. Avoid creating intense competition among students. There is a wealth of literature out there that talks about how competition among students in the classroom actually demotivates students uh, to a great extent. And think about what we're doing here. Part of the reason we hold high expectations for all students is so that we eliminate that competition that has negative impacts on students and their learning. Be enthusiastic. That's a sort of a sidebar. I, don't know. I guess you can be in the U.S. system and not be enthusiastic, but hopefully you will be. Design assessment that encourage the kind of learning that you want your students to achieve. Those are things that all go back to motivating students. So, I also think that as you look at the millennial generation, for those of you that like to kind of play around with the Gen X characteristics or the baby boomer characteristics and the millennial characteristics, I think there's some things that we get from the USN model that may have positive benefit when teaching the millennial generation. So the millennials are the post-Gen X generation, defined as anyone born between 1982 and 2002. Some of their characteristics of this group is that they were brought up in the information age. And so they've had easy access to more information via electronic resources. They don't view anyone, even a professor, as the expert. But rather, the professor is someone with expertise. Now, obviously, this has an implication for faculty. And if you go in expecting them to just accept what you're going to say, I think they're going to be disappointed. And I think probably we've all experienced that at some point in time with teaching millennials. But the implication then for the faculty is don't be the expert. They don't expect you to be the expert, don't be the expert. Don't be the sage on the stage, be the guide on the side. In other words, guide their learning. Don't be the center of sort of their trying to tell them what to do. The other implication for faculty with millennials, be ready for students to challenge or question information and assumptions. And sometimes I think we look at that as faculty as not necessarily a, a good thing. Certainly sometimes it's an uncomfortable thing. But if we really think about it, it's actually good that they're questioning. And that we're providing them, they're thinking about it more critically. Thinking about that information more critically. Also, millennials were brought up in an age where the entertainment industry was catering to them and with an ex expectation to be entertained. So they may place a high priority on quote unquote edutainment. Now, what does this mean for you as faculty? Well, certainly I don't think that you have to be entertainers. Um, some people are more entertaining than others naturally, and you can do what you can in the classroom to try to be entertaining. Sometimes it doesn't actually work, but, um, <laughs> but in any event, I don't think you have to try to be an entertainer. You should at least recognize that the learning environment should be at least stimulating to them so they don't get bored. This group of individuals brought up during the millennials get bored very easily. So provide a lot of activities that allow them to engage in the learning process. These kids are also sometimes called helicopter kids. And they're called helicopter kids because their parents have hovered over them. Their baby boomer parents have hovered over them, watching every move, giving them feedback, and ensuring that they have everything they need. So they've gotten feedback to the nth degree from the time that they're a kid. So they kind of expect a great level of feedback in the learning environment as well. So the implication for faculty is you need to communicate, provide feedback, and also provide a context and rationale for the outcomes. In other words, it's not just, you don't just say, okay, well, you need to learn this because I say so. You need to under, have them understand why you're having them learn what they're learning. But our didactic course content is delivered in blocks, covering one subject area at a time. Those blocks vary in length from as short as two days to about six, maybe even eight weeks, depending on the nature, material, importance, and emphasis on the content. For us in our P1 year, it really focuses on the basic and pharmaceutical science foundations. And the P2 year, the clinical and therapeutic science is presented using an ordered system-based approach. We have a student summit assessment every Friday, every other Friday, and a remediation assessment every other Monday. I probably should say reassessment there. 
that's kind of how our two-week schedule lays out in the P1 and the P2 years. Again, very familiar to college of pharmacy faculty, but I thought I'd put it up there for faculty and staff, faculty from other programs and staff. So in our content, our students are, uh, for each summative assessment, students accumulate about 48 hours of contact hours in the classroom. Our academic year is 36 weeks long, so in comparison to a traditional semester system, those are about 32 weeks long, and a quarter system is about 33 weeks long. So our academic year is actually a little bit longer. We have more contact hours than traditional four-year pharmacy programs. So we have about a total of 2020 total didactic and experiential hours versus about 1,500 as an average number of didactic and experiential hours in four-year programs. I thought I'd kind of walk you through what my typical day using USN 101 looks like. I typically will come in and for the first hour, um, we'll spend that, the students will take a quiz in class over the prior day's material, and then we will, uh, then I'll give them feedback on the quiz, and I, I try to assess not only how individual students have achieved on that quiz, but also the class as a whole. And the nice thing again about having the six hour day is that if I find the class as a whole, it's just totally blanking on one of the concepts. They didn't get one of the questions right. We have the time to go back and try to correct that and make sure students understand that before it comes to the, the summative assessment time uh, on the, every other Friday. So after that first opening quiz and feedback, formative assessment and feedback, I'll spend about the next hour delivering new material, typically in a lecture format. Might be a little longer than that sometimes, but an hour to maybe two hours of lecture. After that, I break them up into their teams, and they do some um, active learning that's related to the lecture that I just gave. Uh, the key with doing that is providing the feedback to the teams, either as a whole or individually as I'm walking around um, in the classroom and seeing how they're uh, resting with the team activities. Break for lunch. After you come back, maybe another hour worth of lecture, some more team activities. And at the end of the day, we'll do some feedback, wrap up, tying up loose ends. Um, this is a place where you can incorporate some of those active learning strategies, like a minute paper, where at the end of the day you say, okay, or here's a good one, muddiest point. Have the students write down the three muddiest points from the day. You collect that, those papers at the end of the day, and then you have something to build on the next day. Say, okay, most of you didn't get this during the class, so we're going to spend a little bit more time on this before we go into new material the next day. But notice that in my typical day here, I've got two, maybe three hours worth of lecture. The rest of the time is students in either formative assessment and feedback, which is a form of active learning, if you think about it, or in collaborative learning, active learning scenarios where they're in the teams. So lecture is not predominating my day on those days. Team learning activities that I've done in the past, case studies, one of my favorite is scaffolding, um, problem solving, different scenarios, role playing, debates, I know you're saying what scaffolding is where you provide sort of, uh, sort of a foundation for them to connect the dots in material. So it might be putting together a chart that has empty spaces in them for them to, to fill out. It might be creating decision trees where you have components of the decision tree that are left open for students to fill in. So you're scaffolding that learning process. And I, I, that's a very effective tool. And I think students really like that because it helps them end, uh, it ends up helping them study from the test. And just a, sort of another side note, sometimes when I'm putting together team activities, I think to myself, well, what would I do to study for my own test? And so I put together a learning activity that's sort of how I would study for my test if I were doing it. And then that in turn helps the students and they love that. They love those types of activities. They really, they feel are very much directed toward them achieving those outcomes and being successful every other Friday. Um, assessment. Assessment should have a formative as well as a summative component. Again, another very, um, what I want. A uh, very active component of the literature talks about assessment and feedback. And really, without feedback, assessment is useless. 
So if we're just assessing students without giving them feedback on their performance, then we really aren't doing our justice to them as educators. So the most effective feedback has the following characteristics. It occurs on several levels, self-assessment, peer assessment, and expert assessment. It includes, uh, sorry, feedback. Um, it occurs in close proximity timelines to the assessment. There's a lot of information in the literature about this. The closer you pair feedback to assessment, the more students learn. And think about what happens in a more traditional system. The student takes an assessment at a midterm. It maybe takes them two weeks to get that assessment back. At that point, the feedback that you give them is two weeks removed from the time in which they were assessed. So what can the students actually get out of that? They may get something out of it, but it's not nearly as powerful as if I were to say, Megan, your hair is not parted on the right. Let's part it on the left. And you immediately part it on the left. Sure. Assessment and feedback. There's no part in your hair. It's okay. okay. So the system of assessment with feedback and reassessment is what we kind of collectively call the assess, detect, correct mechanism in the USN system. And then after you correct that learning, you need to reassess to ensure that students have actually achieved those outcomes. So formative, assess uh, formative assessment uh, hopefully is incorporated into daily activities in the classroom. And that formative assessment can be totally informal. In other words, you can think, use things like the in-class audience response systems, like the turning point technology that we have in class. That is a mechanism of formative assessment that we have available to us. The minute papers, where you have students write for a minute about the most important thing that they learned that day, and then you take that back, take a look at it, and give them feedback on that minute paper. The muddiest point, like I talked about before, and the quick things that you guys got to do just a little bit earlier. And again, there's several different mechanisms of informal, formative assessment feedback. You can do more formal formative assessment. And that's more like a written quiz, where it doesn't count for anything, but it provides practice for the summative assessment, plus it provides a platform for faculty providing feedback to individual students or classes as a whole. And again, I use both informal and formal formative assessments in the classroom. Okay, so the summative assessment process, at least in the College of Pharmacy, is basically an all-day affair, one day every other week. From 8 to 10, each student completes the assessment individually and then submits that assessment to faculty. From 10 to 11, the team gets together and completes the, the same assessment as the team, submits that back to faculty. So again, here what we've done in terms of this system is we have paired feedback immediately with assessment. And with the team taking the assessment, that is feedback at the peer level, okay? And then after the team is done, the <coughs> faculty come in and review the assessment items. Another level of feedback, this time at the expert level. Student learning is occurring throughout every component of this feedback mechanism as well. 12 to 1, lunch, and student and faculty get get busy in Christy's office, and then we hand back score reports and instructions for remediation preparation. So, again, uh, with the system, we're assessing students, we're providing immediate feedback, both at the peer and at the expert <coughs> level, detecting and correcting problems with student understanding of concepts, and preparing them to be reassessed. So, um, and as you know, how we work our system in the College of Pharmacy, we record the student's individual assessment score, the individual team assessment score is recorded, and if the student's team score is greater than or equal to 95%, the fire <coughs> is added to the student's individual assessment score. If the student receives a total combined score greater than or equal to 90%, the student receives a pass for that assessment. If they receive less than 90%, they restudy the material over the weekend and return Monday for reassessment. Also, we don't curb the scores. We may accept alternative answers sometimes, but there's no curbing of the scores. Reassessment. Uh, in our reassessment process, the student returns Monday after each Friday assessment at 8 a.m. for content review and clarification. The student
student sits for a reassessment, which is an all new assessment uh, with items covering the same content. Um, and it, I should say, when I say same content, it doesn't have to be the same content of items that were on the Friday assessment. It can be anything that was within the outcome, the learning outcomes for that two week period leading up to the Friday assessment. In this scenario, the students have to receive a score greater than or equal to 90 percent individually in order to receive a pass, so there's no team assessment on Mondays. Students who do not pass following a Monday reassessment return in the summer for summer remediation and reassessment. And in the summer remediation and reassessment process, uh, it's a one-week intensive restudy with faculty. Uh, we administer a summer remediation reassessment on Friday of that week. And again, the students have to receive an individual score better than or equal to 90% progress. Okay, so um, it was interesting that when I was looking at the survey, and, and the last question I asked was questions about the USN system that you wanted to have answered. And while I was preparing for this, I was sort of, again, being a visual thinker, thinking about, well, how should this model actually look? And then somebody asked me that question as a part of the survey. So I thought, well, let me try to put together with my picture concept of what this model would look like. So it starts kind of at this top box, where we use those foundational elements of mastery learning, outcomes-based education, cooperative collaborative learning, and the learning paradigm to create learning experiences for our students in the classroom. Hopefully, that leads to student learning. And how do we know whether there has been student learning or not? Well, we do a formative assessment, where hopefully we detect any issues or problems with respect to what students have learned, or haven't learned, as the case may be. We provide feedback to the students in order to correct those deficiencies. And then we help them to reset their learning, or correct the deficiencies that were noted in the feedback. Once they've had their learning reset, we do a formative or summative reset, reassessment of learning, or again, we're trying to detect the problems and issues. Again, giving them feedback. And if this process works, what we have is sort of this iterative loop. And again, I will draw you back to our golf example. It's the way, same thing that we talked about with respect to learning is how to putt. You Give it a try. If you don't make it, figure out, get feedback on how you need to make it. Take the necessary corrective action. You retry until you hit the mark. Okay, so a word about the word remediation. Definition of remediation. The act of correcting or improving deficient skills. At USN, it is the process of detecting and correcting student deficiencies and attaining the desired learning outcomes. And kind of in conjunction with that, I asked a survey question. Um, true or false, remediation means, means allowing students to be assessed on material more than once. And the response we got here was mostly true, that most people thought that remediation simply meant retesting the students. So, what do you think at this point? Would you still say that remediation means testing the students again? No. Hopefully the answer is no, right? Because remediation is really a process. It's a process that involves not only formative assessment, but feedback, corrective action, and reassessment. So that if we look at our model, I'm going to ask you as a quick think, or whatever we're going to use the same think, pair, share model, where is remediation in this model? So think about the answer on your own. Share your answer with a neighbor, and then we'll see if everybody agrees. Yeah, it's pretty much everything that's in the light bluish colors there. So I would say starting from formative assessment and all the way through that blue, that is the process of remediation. It's not just an exam or not just an assessment. It's assessment, feedback, correction, and reassessment. It's a whole loop that's involved in remediation. Which is kind of why I'm glad in the College of Pharmacy in anyway, we stop calling the Monday test the remediation test. It's the reassessment, which I think is a much more accurate portrayal of what that Monday reassessment is going to be. All right, so a lot of folks wanted to see statistics and results, so let's talk about some College of Pharmacy results. 
essay surveys. Students report a great deal of satisfaction with how the program works. A lot of times we see what brought you here. We ask the question, what brought you here? It was the block system, the design, the curriculum, the 90%. See a lot of positive reactions in graduating students are raised to the block system, the system of assessment, and active learning strategies that we incorporate into the college of pharmacy. Probably the best thing is students recommend this program to their friends and relatives. Of course, then there's our NAPLEX score. And actually, I probably should have updated this because we got uh, more recent NAPLEX scores that puts us actually at four years now um, with results at the 97 to 99% range in terms of. Um, and even um, kind of more interesting, as you look at the distribution of our scores, we have a very high percentage of our students scoring in the upper 10% and upper 5% nationally. Um, so, and that's to say we don't have our low scoring students too, but in terms of the percentiles and how our curve looks compared to the national curve, we do have a fairly large number in that upper 10% to upper 5% nationally. Okay, so quickly, if I can get some questions. Let's go through some of the implications for faculty of incorporating all of these philosophies we've just been talking about into the classroom. First and foremost, I think one of the things that you learn very early on as a new faculty uh, at USN is it requires a lot more extensive classroom preparation time. It takes a lot more time to think of really good learning activities and how to incorporate those into a six hour day than it does to prepare a 50 minute lecture. On the other hand, at least in my opinion, it's a lot more rewarding to put together, to be creative, and, and design those learning activities than it is to preparing a lecture. With that, you may need, as faculty, to create some faculty development programs that center on how to create good active learning activities in the classroom, or collaborative learning in the classroom. Implication, you have very concentrated teaching time, uh, I think most college of faculty, college of pharmacy faculty would say, well, when I'm in the classroom teaching for several days within a block, not a whole lot else I can do. Um, that's a fair assessment. Uh, but the trade-off is I think you get better, more frequent, and more involved interactions with all students. I think there's not a faculty member in the college of pharmacy that would say that after they walk out of the classroom because of interacting with the students on a very concentrated basis day after day and interacting with students in the team environment, they don't get to know those students a lot better than if you were simply meeting 145 students 50 minutes a day every other day for 10 weeks or 15 weeks of the semester. Um, because the teaching time is, for, uh, is very focused, there's more focused uninterrupted time after teaching is completed to devote to service and scholarship. Bad side, you have to write two unique assessments for the uh, Friday and for the, the Monday. And I know like some, there are some gamblers amongst the College of Pharmacy faculty that write the Friday assessment and say, oh, I think everybody's going to pass, so I'm going to write my Monday assessment, and then spend their weekend writing the Monday assessment. So <laughs> my advice is always write them both at the same time. And actually that has some other benefits because one of the things that students like to say is, well, the Monday reassessment was so much harder than the Friday reassessment. And it's really nice to be able to say to students, well, you know what, I wrote them both at the same time, so one didn't influence the other. Um, your assessment items. If you're going to assess students and expect them to achieve 90%, um, then your assessment items have to be of high quality. I think the flip side of this is, in our system, the learning curve in terms of being a proficient item writer for assessments is much steeper than it would be in a more traditional system. You get, just like students get feedback, on their learning, faculty get really quick feedback on their assessment writing ability in this system. But along with that, you may need to have some development programs geared toward writing good assessment items as well. That brings us to some of your questions. So in the survey, I took a look at the response to what questions do you have about the top system, and I kind of picked out, at least initially here, five that were either very common or ones that um, might allow me to be a bit of a myth buster, hopefully. So, the first one. I saw this a couple of times. Where do textbooks, outside reading, guidelines, literature reviews, et cetera, fit into the USN system? Um, I think most of you sort of know how I feel about textbooks, but I want you to think about 
What is the purpose of a textbook? I heard somebody say it. It's a guide, but more specifically, what does it do? It delivers information, right? And what we said with this USN system and the philosophy is we've got to do a heck of a lot more than just deliver information. We need to create learning experiences. Textbooks can't do that. And I guess I would submit that as you create, as an instructor, as you create your individual learning experiences, while you can rely on a textbook for background content, that textbook is not going to present things necessarily the way you would present them in the classroom. And I think you're going to be a much better instructor, a more powerful instructor, if you divorce yourself a little bit from the textbook, not in terms of necessarily of content, but in delivery of content, so that you're creating that learning experience that the student can really take something powerful away from, a lot away with. Now, I have a little bit different um, reaction to the other components of this outside reading. I think outside reading can have a place. I think the key to making outside reading uh, a component of the USN system is not to sign outside reading because you think that a doctoral read program should have outside reading. That's not a good answer. If you have outside reading, it should be something that lends itself to adding to the student's learning experience. And you should have not only created outcomes for what happens in the class then, but very clear expectations as to what you expect the student to get out of that outside reading. Just saying to the student, read chapter nine, is not very helpful. What is helpful to the student is read chapter nine and be able to X, Y, Z, whatever it is that relates to what you're trying to conceptualize in the students. Guideline literature use. I'm assuming that we're talking here about uh, treatment guidelines and literature uh, reviews with respect to treatment and, and how treatment uh, should occur, at least in the healthcare system. Again, I think those have absolute application in the USN system. Again, the key is, though, to be clear to students what your expectations are with respect to those guidelines or those literature reviews. What should they be getting out of that? What should they come to you with? What should they be able to demonstrate once they have seen this guideline or read this guideline or read these literature reviews. Okay. Anybody else have a question sort of along those same lines? All right. Ah, this is a good one. I like this question. And it came up a couple of different times in the, in the survey. Does all relevant material be presented, be presented during class time in the, or in the notes can instructors ask questions on assessment that aren't covered in the lecture? My answer to you is I would sincerely hope so. Okay? Because if we are only asking them questions on what specifically is in the notes, then we are asking them to get at those higher order level, higher order level thinking outcomes. However, there's a caveat to this. The caveat is, again, you have to go back to your learning outcomes and clearly state what your expectations are. So if in the class, in the notes, you present a case of a patient with a certain disease state, and then you want the students on the assessment to be able to go a step further. The patient has this disease state plus this other disease state that we talked about three months ago. Then you have to give the students some heads up that that's what the expectation is. Similarly, so you're, you're going to have a, a learning outcome that might be apply what you know about diabetes to XYZ. So you may not have to present XYZ in the classroom and, and test them specifically on that, provided that you write that outcome expectation such that the student knows what to expect. And I would also suggest that you follow that up with an activity that allows them to practice that, that, that skill. One of the things I like to say about the system and why the team activities and the formative assessment that we do is so important is you can kind of draw an analogy to a pianist, okay? Even the most accomplished pianist, you wouldn't hand them a Beethoven uh, concerto, piano concerto, on Friday and ask them to go Friday night in the Carnegie Hall and perform. 
forms, right? That's just not realistic, and that's not a fair expectation. So if we're expecting our students to apply that knowledge in ways in which go beyond what's presented in the notes, then give them opportunities to practice that in the team activities and in the learning activities that you construct in the classroom. And I think then the students are going to be less, much less frustrated. Because then, when, that, when it comes to test challenge time, and they say, well, you didn't cover that in the notes, you can say, oh, well, you know what? We did this team activity that is very similar to what I just put on this assessment. And so, yes, I do expect you to be able to do that. And I go back to this outcome statement that said, look, I expected you to analyze this case and come up with why this treatment scenario was wrong. So write your outcome statements clearly. The goal is that it includes students to the fact that you're going beyond what's just in the notes. And two, give them opportunities to practice that in the active learning activities that you do in the classroom. My students over here are laughing. I, I, I'm doing teaching elective, and so I made my students in my teaching elective come, to, come today. So they're laughing. I don't know. Oh, that's a good laugh. All right. How do we avoid the memorized dump syndrome in students? Another good question came up in several different iterations on the survey results. Again, a couple different ways to respond here. One is, again, in communicating the expectations and assessment. If we assess based on memorization, they're going to memorize and dump. If you ask them to go beyond and use higher order skills in the assessment, they're going to avoid that. The other component to this, though, is structuring the curriculum such that, remember we talked about the instructional paradigm versus the learning paradigm, that we aren't atomistically delivering content where content is siloized and then assessed and then is never used again. We've got to coordinate our content, coordinate our curriculum, so that they, the students have to come back and utilize information that they used before. And we've got to set that expectation up in our students, whether, again, whether it's the, the outcome statements that we write or whether it's in the team activities and, the, and active learning activities that we have them do in the classroom. Another great question. We love this question. Does or can the curriculum committee have the authority to identify and recommend removal of material considered to be excessive, meaning not required, or could be presented in less depth? Well, I hope so. Because if the curriculum committee can't do that, then we're back to what we talked about before. We've got a bloated curriculum full of junk that doesn't need to be there, full of stuff that doesn't get us to the end point of creating a graduate that's going to be effective. So the curriculum committee, in my opinion, absolutely has the responsibility, not just the ability, but the responsibility to give feedback to the instructors to say, no, I'm not going to appro approve this block because this content is not relevant what, it need, what, what a student needs to be, a part, to be a part of this. Or you're covering so much, you're spending so much time on content X that we're ignoring this other important content content Y. So I hope hope so and I hope all the curriculum committees go out of here today and, and think about that and really really you really need to hold the rest of the faculty to that same high standard. That's your job as the curriculum committee. Alright. Then another question that I absolutely love. Why do we strive to write learning outcomes that must be acceptable by multiple choice question? I wonder if we could have more powerful outcome statements that challenge students at a higher level if the outcomes had greater depth and breadth. This assumes that well-conceived team activities are dovetailed with learning outcomes and that in turn relate to multiple choice questions. And I like that last sentence because I think that last sentence is really key. Um, it shows that the person that wrote the question really understands what we're trying to do. Okay. So, I think underlying this question, though, is an assumption or a myth that I think needs to be busted. And that is that multiple choice questions cannot possibly get at higher order levels of loose taxonomy in the way that they assess students. There is a plethora of literature out there that shows that multiple choice questions can indeed and sometimes do better than what's called constructive response type questions, which are short essay, fill in the blank essay questions at getting at higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So I think that's an important thing to, to, to get off the table and start out with a question. How much do we state what you just said? Because I just need to hear it again. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
those questions and not yeah. achieve So if you read this question, I think the underlying context of this question is that multiple choice questions cannot possibly get at some of the higher order level Bloom's taxonomy things like analyze, synthesize, um, uh, what's another one? Select, right. evaluate. And again, I would say that that's, that's really is a myth. The, there's plenty of examples in the literature that show that multiple choice questions can and do get at higher order Bloom's level taxonomy. You have to, I mean, it has to be written in that way. But it can get there. And quite frankly, there are some, some studies that show that not only are moves or are multiple choice questions able to get at those levels, but sometimes they do it even better than what's called constructive response type questions, where it's a short essay or answer. I will give you that multiple choice questions are very difficult at getting at the one blue higher or blooms at taxonomy level called create. It's going to be hard to create something with a multiple choice question. But in terms of synthesis, analysis, application, evaluation, those can all be got at in a multiple choice question. Now, having said that, I think we get a little tripped up with the verbs in the learning outcomes. And um, it's true that the verbs are important, but they're not the be all end all. So the verbs are important in communicating to students what the expectations are, and to kind of give them a sense, a sense of how the assessment is going to take place. At what level are you going to assess? Um, however, I would submit, and I have seen, examples of multiple choice questions that get at the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, where the outcome statement would have been using the verb identify. And if you and I'm use identify as an example, there's several other examples you can think of. Now, if you look at the typical thing that you see in a, um, a teaching seminar, for example, uh, well, here are the verbs that get at Bloom's taxonomy level one, and here are the verbs that get at Bloom's taxonomy level two. Identify is always in level one, and it presumes that identify means knowledge base. Again, I would submit to you the more important thing here is how is that question constructed? If the question is constructed where it might be, um, Given these scenarios, again, scenarios that they have not necessarily seen before, identify the most important factor that led to this therapeutic outcome. That's not a lower level Bloom's taxonomy, uh, taxonomic structure. That's a much higher level. They're having to analyze, analyze data, apply data, and come up with a new response, synthesize data with a new response. So, I think what is more important, and what I would suggest to you, is that our multiple choice questions are indeed testing at pretty much all levels of Bloom's taxonomy. What you need to do, and an exercise that I highly recommend for all faculty, um, in terms of seeing what specifically you're assessing, and then coming up with outcome statements that mirror what you're assessing, take a test that you've written. Go through every item on that test and create a learning outcome from the assessment item. You'll see pretty quickly specifically what you ask the students to do and at what level you ask them to do it. And again, I'll submit to you that even with our multiple choice questions, we're getting at higher level order, higher order level balloons taxonomies. So I don't think the problem is the multiple choice. I think it's more educating ourselves a little bit more on what Bloom's taxonomy actually means not getting too hung up on charts of verbs, and really looking at critically how are we assessing our students and at what level are we assessing our students. The advantage of the multiple choice questions, obviously, is we can get feedback to students immediately. And as I said before, the key to student learning from assessment is feedback that's juxtaposed as closely as possible to the assessment. If you have a short answer or an essay, you're going to have a lot of time in grading those questions. So you're not going to be able to give feedback individually to students very quickly. Secondly, um, and I was, saw this in the literature not too long ago, where they actually compared constructive answer responses to multiple choice responses. And one of the criticisms of multiple choices, well, they become multiple guess. 
And what they actually found in analyzing those two formats of question writing is guessing is just as prominent in constructive answer responses as it could be in multiple choice. And the reason is that students dump the kitchen sink into that essay, hoping to get partial credit. So they haven't analyzed or thought deeply about the question simply because you constructed it in an essay format or a short answer format. They just dumped everything they possibly could in there to see if they could get partial credit. And the last thing I'll say about constructed answer responses is in terms of objectivity. If you think that you have issues with students challenging responses or answers or how, you've been, how they've been assessed on multiple choice questions, wait to have a uh, constructive response exam. Um, I've written those kinds of tests before. I've had experience with those types of tests before. And it, you alleviate a lot of problems with a very objective type of test construction. So having said that, should we use multiple choice assessment exclusively in our educational model? I would say the answer is no. There are several things, like skills development, that really are not amenable to a multiple choice type of assessment. The key with doing other types of assessment on skills and, and development of skills over time is to have, again, clear rubrics so that you can assess, clearly communicate your expectations and assess how well students have met those. And then again, I would submit to you that those don't become a 90%. Those are much more like our experimental outcomes that we have in IPPEs and APPEs, where it's yes or no. Can they do, can they not do? Can they do at this level? What are the elements that say that a student can analyze a prescription and appropriately dispense the right medication? Those are there and you can assess those very easily and it's not in multiple choice format. Okay? So, I see by the clock on the wall, I've already gone over by 15 minutes. So I guess I'll just open it up to the floor in case anybody has any questions. Question, yes ma'am. Did I understand you saying that on your reassessment that no good points are awarded? That's right. On the reassessment, no good points are awarded. Anyone know why? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I will tell you why. A um, couple of reasons. One is they've the students that are going through the Monday reassessment have already had a sort of extensive feedback and had the advantage of the team assessment and the faculty review, and they should be further along at that point than somebody who took the Friday assessment and passed 90%, number one. Number two, what do you do when you only have one person that comes back from Monday reassessment, or even two people that come back from Monday reassessment? That's not a team anymore. And so it's not fair. And so you have it consistently across the board. We said no team points on that every assessment. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, sir. There's a style of question that's technically multiple choice, but the structure is different most of It was introduced maybe in the last 10 years in the graduate management. You know what I find is a lot of times I, I see I see and sometimes even do stuff in the classrooms and then I read it in the literature and then I figure out what it's called. So I just based on the name, I, I'm not familiar with that, although if you showed it to me I would say, oh yeah, this is
And again, if you didn't get your questions answered, if you submitted something on the survey and you didn't get your question answered, just stop by my office. My, my doors open all the time. So just come by and, and we can have a nice chat. Fireside chat. All right, thank you. Thank you.